Well, what about the Libertarian Party? Can you tell us a little bit about what it stands for? Libertarian Party is based on a firm principle of non-aggression. We all take a pledge when we join the party that we will never initiate force against somebody else. That is uh, you know, a pretty simple principle that everybody should endorse. It's a principle of what makes civilization. That is, you respect other people's life, and you respect other people's property. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not murder. It's, a, it's that simple, and most everybody agrees to that. And uh, the next question ought to be is, well, why, does, why should you be different than Republican and Democrats if they tend to agree with that same principle? Well, we, we believe it's such an important moral principle that if we can't take somebody else's property and we can't hurt anybody or we can't intimidate anybody or threaten to use force, we don't think the government can either. But we see the government as the initiator of force to bring about social and economic changes day in and day out. I mean, they, they may not come up to our front door with a gun, and occasionally they do, but we know if we don't deliver our money and our records and do obediently what the government wants in order to give up our portion of our income through the Internal Revenue Service, the gun will be quickly at our door and we will be in prison. So it's the threat and the intimidation, and therefore they're transferring wealth, something that we can't do as individuals. So we as libertarians reject this whole idea of forcible redistribution of wealth, which is the welfare state. Same way in personal liberties. We apply this principle in the area of personal liberties, and although I might want you and think you should leave a certain, lead a certain lifestyle, because I think it's good and right and moral, I have no right to tell you what to do. You know, if, if you want to live a certain way, and I disagree, that's, that's tough. You know, that's your, your choosing. That's the individual's choice, as long as you don't hurt somebody else. So the person has the right to his own life and his liberty, his own lifestyle, as with one special rule that your lifestyle, the individual's lifestyle, can't hurt somebody else. So if you do things that I disapprove of, I, as a libertarian, am tolerant and I accept that up until the point of no injury to anybody else. Now, I talk uh, to libertarians or listen to them, review them on TV, and they're talking about government power all the time and abuse of governmental power. But I also see some libertarians, not a whole lot of them, but a lot of them also talk about corporate power as well. In other words, they're talking about power in general. There seem to be two types of libertarians. Well, um, I, don't, I don't find, I, I think we have one type of libertarian because we all accept the same principle. I think it's more easily found that you have several types of Republicans and several types of Democrats because they're interventionists and they can intervene any way they want. But uh, I think libertarians are pretty consistent in certainly condemning the power of government. Uh, I haven't heard a libertarian saying that we need more government or they're not a libertarian. But on the corporate power, I think where the confusion might come is corporate size, if it's gained by serving the consumer, is not necessarily evil. So if, uh, if you have 90% uh, of the car industry, for some miraculous reason or for some unknown reason, there's no imports. If you have 90% of it, that doesn't bother me as a libertarian if you have the best car at the best price and the consumers are very happy. Now, if you, own, if you have 90% or 100% of a utility company and you're gouging the customers and the customers have no place else to go, we detest the corporate size. We detest corporate power when it's gained through government power, you know, government coercion, if it's a contract. Uh, the military industrial complex is a pretty good example of how large industries benefit by big government. Of course, in big banking, big banks benefit by this monetary system because they're sort of in collusion with the Federal Reserve System, so we detest that. We detest bigness and we detest corporate power when it's gained through privilege from government. If corporations are large, and, and there's always free entry in a free market. If they're large because they serve the consumer, we don't worry too much about that because we know the consumer is benefiting. If they get to the point if they had 100% of an industry, which is not possible in a free market, but let's say just for instance, if they had 100% and then they started to gouge the people, there would immediately be competition. The pe you know, there has to be, there always has to be free entry and free competition. But there's nobody's ever figured out uh, where there's ever been a, a true monopoly in a free market system. The, all monopolies can be traced to some form of government protectionism. Well, of course, now we talk about uh, government and uh, corporations, 
but as you've set up at the top they're all the same people the uh, corporate uh, executives go to and from the uh, government they hold positions in the government uh, the people from the uh, trilateral commission and the Bilderbergers and all they're all corporate people and uh, they have their relationships and interlocks with the banks and with uh, universities and foundations and all that. So to talk about one, so you're really talking about one source of power instead of corporation on one side and government on the other, because it's all one pot, as you said. I, I think it's become one pot. Not only that is uh, you, you don't have any help by, say, voting for a Democrat who may be a little more critical of large corporations. But we know Democrats are just as much in bed with big government, too. I mean, you take a Michael Dukakis, for instance. Uh, do you think maybe uh, Boston uh, was a somewhat dependent on some military contracts with Tip <laughs> O'Neill? I mean, they're just as much. It's all demagoguery when it comes to these political campaigns. So uh, either side, they're, they're the same people control it. And, you know, Ronald Reagan spoke sharply against the Trilateral Commission, but he was the first president to host the Trilateral Commission in the White House. I mean, that's how blatant it is. It's, this, it's the same group of people. Uh, that's why... Uh, you find uh, no political action committee, no large corporation who supports libertarians. I voted, while in Congress, I think the, the, uh, the strictest free market set of votes ever, but I never got political action committee money. But small business people who want to compete against big business, they're, they're free market people and they're much more likely to be libertarians and believe in the principles of free enterprise. But once the corporations get real large, and they're more interested in paying a couple hundred thousand dollars for a top lobbyist who knows the system, who can get a regulation that exempts their corporation or gets their contract in place. And uh, this, this is the way the system works. So we reward uh, the lobbyists and the political action committees much more so than we reward a principle of freedom. What about this uh, banking and currency committee? Uh, and we've had uh, Congressman Gonzalez on, who's one of your colleagues, right. and uh, he sees the world very clearly and sees the power structures at work. And I'm sure you have a clear picture of this also. Is this one of the reasons you became a libertarian instead of a Republican? Well, it's certainly one of the reasons why I got involved in politics, because I was very fascinated with economics and particular, particularly monetary policy. And um, if you think about it, money is pretty important. If you look at all transactions, whether you're buying something or selling your services, one half of all economic transactions is the monetary unit. So if somebody has control over the value of the monetary unit, they control every transaction. Therefore, if you have an institution, such as a government ordained bank, like a central bank, like our Federal Reserve, if they have absolute monopoly control over the value of that currency, they control everything in the economy. It becomes a form of a government-regulated economy. It doesn't become socialism, but the money obviously is socialistic in that the government controls it. So if they increase the supply, the value goes down. If they tighten the supply, interest rates go up. So it's tremendous economic power. And the insiders, those who know what the policy is, literally can benefit. They don't stuff their pockets and line their pockets with cash. That's not the way it happens. But those who are in the inside and knowledgeable will benefit because they know which direction interest rates are going and which way the economy is going. And uh, if you look at the members of the Federal Reserve, you find out that they don't ask people like me to be on the Federal Reserve, even though I've had experience on studying the issue and been on the banking committee. They ask only the people who are casually referred to as the insiders, those from Wall Street and the banking industry, the Paul Volkers and the Alan Greenspans of the world, they're on the inside. They know how to deal with the establishment and they get these positions and therefore it is a tremendous amount of economic power falls in the hands of what we call the Open Market Committee, the Federal Open Market Committee. They control from day to day the supply of money. They become the legal counterfeiters. You know, if you and I had control of the printing press, we could do a lot of, a lot of things, you know, self-serving. That's what happens when the politicians create the central bank that, that control the money. Now, this control of the central bank and the money goes on regardless of which party is in power, right? It never changes. You know, uh, uh, they change a person here and there, 
but it's always the insiders. It's always from the same group. So if you have a Republican as president or the Democrats, they're going to get the same appointments. Appointments never change. And this can be said about the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Treasury and, and the Federal Reserve Board members. They all come from the same group. And even though, I guess naively, I th was hopeful that the same group of individuals would not have as much power under, Ron under Ronald Reagan. But, you know, I was there, I witnessed it, and of course that led to my disenchantment, my disappointment, enough to the point where I just said, I've had enough, and then I left the Republican Party and joined the Libertarian Party with the idea that you cannot trust Republicans to be independent of the system either, although Ronald Reagan led us to believe that he would be independent. <laughs>